I forgot in the year or two since the last time I was out on a VW bus trip how cold your feet can get in the off-season. Buses aren't sealed like modern vehicles, there are just open holes in the floor where the pedals move through, and under that just an armor plate to protect the cables that reach all the way back to the engine and transmission in the rear. That plate has fallen off and been run over more than a time or two, so the wind howls through the gaps in the plate, and up through the gaps in the floor, and up through the gaps in my pant leg. The wind creeps in through where the rubber is missing in the window frames, and it creeps in from the screw holes that secure the fiberglass camping top. The cold settles on things and makes them feel wet to the touch with a humid chill. The early spring roads are covered in ice, and there's hardly anyone out here on the eastern Oregon plain, but I'm out here because I've just got three weeks to travel from Seattle, at the northwesternmost tip of the country, to deep southern New Mexico in order to catch a rare chance to visit what is, arguably, the birthplace of the modern world. The Trinity Site where the world's first atomic bomb was detonated on July 16, 1945. It changed the direction of human history, human science, and human culture. In a lot of my favorite genre fiction, the Trinity Test represents the end of the reign of magic, too, and the rise of an age of cold rationality, a time when the deeper mysteries of the universe become domesticated and every day. Atomic energy is either, optimistically, the end of the beginning for humanity, or, pessimistically, the beginning of the end. Nuclear weapons used to be something people worried about every day, but I was three years old when the Berlin Wall fell, so the whole duck-and-cover era was as foreign to me as the horse-drawn buggy and its time. My first encounter with atomic history and iconography was with the video game Fallout, which came to me at an especially impressionable time in my life and took a huge hold on my imagination. Part of this trip was to cover the landscapes of those games, to replicate on the byways what I'd done with clicks of my mouse. My route only makes sense when taking that into account. I went on huge, huge detours to catch glimpses of those fictionalized places. That side of the story is covered in the companion video, The Real Life Landscapes of Fallout. This video is about the stuff that goes beyond the scope of fiction and into the weirder, twistier historical artifacts of deep America, where the Trinity site is the ultimate destination. The crater of that world-altering blast still sits in the middle of an active missile range and is only open to visitors two days a year, once in April and once in October. It's free to go, but you do have to show up on the right day at the right time, and that meant heading out into the desert while snow still covered the cactus and sand. At night in eastern Oregon, it got down to 10 or 15 degrees or so, enough so that the fog of my breath at night would turn into a lattice of ice on the window pane when I woke up in the morning. The atomic sands of the Trinity site felt very far away but I was connected to it already by strands of asphalt and gravel, all waiting to be spooled onto the loom of the bus's chattery old engine. This was a completely different sort of trip than the last one I took, and I had spent a year meticulously stringing together different locations and routes into a carefully choreographed, heavily zigzagging procession through natural, native, and atomic history. I went around two to four hundred miles a day, camped in the bus most nights, but I also spent a few nights in cities, most often to cover something in the Fallout video. My wife was working a managerial job and couldn't spend six weeks on the road. Our Shih Tzu, Simon, was getting old and didn't much care for bus travel anyway, so I left them both in Seattle to keep the domestic candle lit. On the road, I brought Maybe, a miniature blue healer that Kendra and I had bought on the last big bus trip we did together. Maybe and I get more restless than Kendra and Simon do, and we both sure love the woods, so it seemed like a natural fit for the two of us to hit the road together again. After two people, two dogs, and one microbus, it felt absolutely palatial in there to have one dude and one small, strange dingo creature sharing the space. Other things had changed, too. My friend Mitty and I had apologized to each other after a particularly spectacular blowout argument the last time we tried to travel together, and so Mitty's home in Bend, Oregon, was my first stop after leaving the familiar freeways of Seattle. I meant to make a couple detours around the city and the lava fields for the fallout side of the trip, but the snows had buried every road that wasn't a significant route, especially the fiddly little dirt roads that I had been highlighting on my maps. So, Mitty and I did what we could in the snow, and went to the small oases of geothermal warmth that bubble up from the icy ranch land. Eastern Oregon is still volcanic, and hot springs dot the mountains and valleys. Even unmarked geothermal pools are obvious all over the hills in this weather. Steam rises in small columns, like the campfires of ghosts from the bone-white woods and reflectively frozen meadows. We camped at a hot springs that put its primary pool inside of an old barn, and even though it was maybe 25 degrees outside, in there it was a cloying, hot 80 degrees, with beams of light piercing the water vapor and crossing the beams of old wood holding up the barn. 
There are hundreds if not thousands of hot springs in America, and most are like this, out of the way, unadvertised, slightly magical. There's no bath culture in America, exactly, so these communal pools feel a little strange socially. Pair that with the isolation, the perpetual chill winds, and the feeling of quiet decay that a lot of these places have, and the experience of bathing in them feels almost transgressively outside the norm for something so simple as a public bath. Like those snow monkeys in nature documentaries, the bus hippies and hunters and wandering academics all soak their strange red asses in the steaming water while the snow on their hairy faces refuses to melt. Further south from the festively named Christmas Valley is one of the only geysers in Oregon, Old Perpetual. Trappers in the area noted the unbearably hot water as early as 1832, but once the pools were developed a little and a lodge was built on the site, they attempted to drill a well into the geothermal waters. It was a mixed success. The well hit more water, but it also spewed that water out at 200 degrees Fahrenheit in a gigantic plume every 90 seconds. Although the hole is man-made, the process is natural, so it counts as a real geyser because it's powered by real volcanism. It's a fun thing to see, but more than that, it was an auspicious way to kick off the journey. Old Perpetual is a strange and beautiful oddity that only exists because someone tampered with a thing that was already a little dangerous, and then kind of broke it in an even more spectacularly dangerous way. Here, it's just little hot water. Soon enough, it'll be radioactive isotopes. Either way, it's quite an eruption. There at Hunter Hot Springs, I was less than 50 miles away from Nevada and the edge of the deep desert, but I'd spend something like 500 more miles getting there to accommodate a detour to the coast to see some Fallout 2 map locations. I'd like to skip right over that whole part of the trip and pick up not too far south of Old Perpetual at the Warner Mountains outside of Alturas, California. I had begun the day at the coast, driven to Redding, driven to Alturas, and now here I was with no daylight left and even less California to go. The Warner Mountains are one of the least used backdoors between the two states, and for some reason I thought being so close to Nevada, they'd be dry and arid. That was my first mistaken assumption about north-central Nevada, the first of many. The land beyond the Warners was some of the strangest and wildest I'd ever seen in my life, but in the meantime I stopped to sleep on the side of the road after realizing that all of the campgrounds that I'd noted earlier were snowed over and closed. In the morning, I got up with the dawn and hit the Nevada border early, early enough that my first taste of this mysterious and underpopulated part of the country was to encounter a herd of cattle completely blocking the pass from the lower desert valley to the upper desert valley towards Gerlach. I drove up to the cowboy, asked him how he wanted me to handle it, and he said, Oh, they're real gentle, just drive on through and they'll move for you. And god damned if they didn't. I shifted into a tentative first gear and they parted like a smelly, furry river around a boulder. We were quite the mashup, the cowboy with his herd and the beardy traveler with his Volkswagen, both of us around 30, both of us looking like some kind of echo from the past. I think we were equally entertained by the situation, too. I caught him cracking up in the rear view to see the high prow of the bus weaving through the moving, farting herd. For the most part, they seemed willing to let me get on past, but one cow stopped dead in front of me to take a massive and defiant piss right on the pavement. I gave him his moment, it's not often a cow gets to pull a power move on a guy like that. I honestly could hardly believe the scene as it was unfolding. Ranching is one of the most iconic professions in America, but it's infrequently that city people like me actually encounter it so directly as this. Most people's world is one of stoplights and strip malls, mine included. This guy's world is so quiet that he can drive a herd of cattle up the byway and still be surprised to see someone rolling up on him. It was a fine introduction to the remote part of parts of the state I was about to see, too. There's nowhere else in America where the sun-bleached bones of the Wild West still stick up from among the tumbleweeds as out here in central Nevada. I don't mean just in terms of ranching, of course. There's plenty of ranching all over. I mean that the histories of gone-away towns and gone-away moments are as ancient and naked as the jagged rock formations that line the highway out here. Seeing cows on the road, that's a piece of old America that's still vibrant and alive. Going further down the highway, further into the desert, Nevada is a mausoleum of the parts of America that walked as far as they could into the unrelenting heat of the future and the desert sun until they collapsed in their tracks and rotted where they lay. Central Nevada was the site of one of the major American gold rushes, with an equally powerful current of a silver rush sweeping men and money into the rugged hills and then ushering them back out again immediately once the rushes were over. One of the best places to get a sense of that era, its loneliness and its beauty, is the ghost town of Berlin, Nevada. 
America is full of places named after other places, named so perhaps because it gave the settlers comfort to have the familiarity, maybe out of ambition for the town's future, or perhaps most likely out of a frontiersy sense of irony to name these dusty nowhere burgs after the great metropolises of Europe. A gold mine was established at the Berlin town site in 1896, and although it was quite profitable in its day, the town only ever supported around 250 people at a time. A labor dispute closed the mine and the town. Mineral extraction companies often operate very close to the margins of their operating costs and are vulnerable to fluctuations in various other markets. Most gold mines in central Nevada also produce a lot of silver in equal or greater proportions, so their viability is more frequently tied to the price of silver than the price of gold. If either metal drops too much in price, the mine has to shut down and more or less hibernate until economic conditions improve. An effort to unionize in the early 20th century was considered by management, but the mine decided that if the workers couldn't live on the wages they were being paid, and the mine couldn't operate at the wages that the workers were demanding, then the compromise was to shut down the whole town. As a consequence of being on private land in an extremely remote landscape, the artifacts, machines, and buildings people left behind stayed right where they were. Even the giant pile of tin cans on the walk down to the cemetery just sat there collecting rust for decades. The Nevada State Parks Department acquired the whole town and put it into a state of what they call protected decay, where the, the park does limited maintenance to ensure that things don't fall down and are relatively safe and stable, but otherwise make sure that neither visitors or academics disturb the historical junk where it lays. If the park does its job, that skeletal pickup truck out by the workshop will still be there for another hundred years, some layers of metal stripped away by rust and wind and sun, but still recognizably a truck even to tomorrow's future tourists. I was pretty much the only person there besides the park supervisor on the day I came out. The roads out to the Berlin town site were still muddy and mottled with snow in March. Even in the busy season, though, I don't see it as being exactly a tourist hotspot. Imagine being out here where these lonely buildings were when that was all that was here, these and a few other structures. A maximum of 250 people, or about the number of people a full-time student might encounter and have classes with on a full-time schedule. Berlin had two saloons at its peak, but each was a tent structure and nothing remains of them, or many other cheaper, simpler, temporary structures. This was a town where everyone knew everyone, not only here, but in the whole valley. Almost all the descriptive plaques in the park are first-person remembrances of people who once lived in the town, who came back to describe their memories and enter them into the historical record. Berlin seems like a hard place to work, with extremes of cold and heat outside the mine and claustrophobic danger inside the mine, but I do feel like it might have been a nice place to live. The plaque for the stagecoach stop doesn't just talk about the stage line, it talks about how, around midnight, the town's security watchman would come in there to warm himself by the fire and have a pull from his whiskey bottle. The plaques for the houses don't just talk about when they were built, they talked about who lived in them, who died in them, and then you can go down to the cemetery and those dead are still there. There's no noise of cars, no lights of any city or any town, no pollution, nothing at all except these humble wood shelters along the floor of a long-gone ocean. In the same park, maybe a mile's walk away, is a fossil shelter for the world's largest concentration of ancient ichthyosaurs. Some catastrophe happened many millions of years ago, where at least 40 of the gigantic sea monsters were all killed in a group and buried in the mud. It's a unique kind of circumstance in natural history. The right beasts, in the right place, under the right conditions, for them to still be there after the continents themselves had enough time to shift around. Berlin will hardly last as long. But that's Nevada for you. Bones on top of bones, going back into forgotten eons and underneath forgotten oceans. Up the valley from Berlin is another small mining town called Ione, but this one's been continuously inhabited this whole time. A hand-painted sign as you're coming in along the hardscrabble main drag declares Ione, the town that refused to die, and that goes for pretty much every town out here. Ione's a particularly unlikely case of hanging on, but everyone out here is fighting against age, neglect, isolation, and a world that pivots on events far over the horizon. Ione was a miner's outpost since its founding, and it will be until the last grizzled geezer left in town rocks their last rocking chair, but how do the money men out here live? Well, in one notable and extremely brief example, they live in an ornate tower looming over the valley. In 1896, Anson Phelps Stokes, then a successful investor in mining infrastructure all over the state, came back from a trip to Italy so inspired by the design of some of its villas that he decided that he'd like one for himself, on the mountain pass where sits the town of Austin, Nevada. 
the expense of building a European-style spire in what was still pretty damn close to the exact middle of nowhere can't be overstated. This isn't too far from Battle Mountain, whose city motto is Halfway to Everywhere, and Battle Mountain is a bustling metropolis compared to the towns down here in the true center of the state. So, Stokes had this incredible tower erected on the most scenic part of the hill, with a long road winding from Austin out along the ridgeline towards it. His tower is three stories tall, with a fireplace on each level and an open patio on the roof for optimal scenic viewing. Or it used to, anyway. The thing is utterly gutted today, but even its corpse is spectacular. Trying to imagine what it must have been like when the stained glass windows and exquisitely crafted floorboards were still intact is an imaginative feast. It is a very, very small window where that imagining would have any relation to reality, though. Stokes Castle, as it's called, was finished in 1897 and then inhabited on just three short occasions over a little less than a year. The Stokes family found their financial empire crumbling towards the end of 1897, and by 1898, they would have sold the castle to pay off business debts and never return to Austin again. No one who owned the castle after that ever saw fit to live in it, and after a while it became properly dangerous to even consider doing so without a complete restoration of the property. Maybe no one who owned it had the imagination to find something to do with the property. So it sat, and it still sits. A man at the height of his personal empire visits Europe, sees a building he loves, then comes home to the seat of his power and pays his men to calcify that memory in concrete, wood, and glass. By the time the symbol of vain dominion is done being built, that empire is turned to ash in the highly volatile ups and downs of Nevada's extraction markets. Instead of glorifying Stokes, his financial ruin and his castle's ruin would be synonymous. Of Stokes, nothing is left but the melancholy of his dream, grasped so briefly and then never again, dirt and snow drifting in through the holes where a would-be king thought his money and his window panes would keep the elements out forever. Going back west along the old Pony Express routes toward Reno, you eventually reach Buckland Station. In the mid-1800s, this entire region was considered native land. It was the Americans who were interlopers, coming in in what must have seemed like a flood of white faces and greedy hands. In 1860, as the snows were starting to melt, ranchers at a nearby way station, William Station, kidnapped several Paiute women from the Pyramid Lake tribe. The tribe retaliated and burned down the station, killing those that they found there. Word about the arson and murders went east, and like a game of telephone with especially heavy consequences, the account of the retaliatory action grew and grew until the Paiute were somehow the villains of the story, and not just a few aggrieved men who lashed out. No, now they were a vicious horde of boogeymen who burned down the station just out of a sheer evil cussed disposition. So, a posse of 105 men rode out to Pyramid Lake to avenge the revenge, and this time it was much more serious. Badly outnumbered, two-thirds of those 105 men never made it back. Burning down William Station was an offense to the settlers, but it was domestic in scope until the story was so sensationalized that it led to the deaths of more than 60 additional men. Taxpaying men. That's something that's going to catch the attention of the army. There was no hope of a peaceful resolution now. Even though the settlers were the first to display barbarism and criminality, their initial crime of kidnapping, and likely rape, had spiraled into what would be the largest military action in Nevada's history. It would lead to the creation of a permanent army base that would cement the newcomers' power in the region. It would be the insult that led to the injury that destroyed the Nevada which the First Peoples had always known. The kidnapping happened in May. By July, the army swept the area in force and forced to retreat and surrender from the Paiute in what became called the Pyramid Lake War. The army immediately began work on Fort Churchill, whose crumbling walls you see in this footage. Fort Churchill was abandoned nine years later in 1869, yet in its time it was not only the first U.S. military base in Nevada, but also one of the largest on the whole frontier. The gold and silver rush that would come later came as smoothly and rapidly as it did because the army had already used its power to pry the land from the fingers of its original owners and then parcel it off to the new money being invested by white Easterners, like Stokes. Fort Churchill is a strange thing to see. Like all desert ruins, it does have a beauty to it. A recent effort to re-adobe the walls of the fort's remaining buildings for the first time in 150 years assures that it will stand for another century or two. 
But what it represents is the last wave of a genocide that we rarely accept responsibility for as Americans. We value independence, individuality, the idea that if someone comes for your home and your family, then you are justified in doing what you have to when it comes to defending it. Hollywood's made a billion dollars or more off of stories of justified revenge. Americans love that shit. But we rarely extend it backwards far enough to include people like the Pied. Their daughters, wives, kidnapped by a bunch of European exiles who felt like a vacuum of law has to necessarily be filled by cruelty. That isn't all settlers, of course, but it was demonstrably and absolutely these particular settlers. So the Pyramid Lake tribe burned the fuckers out. Pretty American of them, isn't it? Liam Neeson does it on the screen and we lap that shit up. The Paiute do it and the long arm of American colonial power reaches out and smashes them in their homes, sweeping them clear so that if a businessman wants to build an Italian-inspired tower somewhere out here, there isn't anyone that they have to ask permission of first. Further down from Reno, in California's Owens Valley, is an equally shameful subversion of our supposed commitment to the sanctity of the individual one of our very own, all-American, World War II concentration camps. In February 1942, Executive Order 9066 was put into effect, and 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and imprisoned for the duration of the war. Most lost homes and businesses. They were expected to pay property taxes, even though they were unable to make any money. Most property was never returned. Most lost everything but their lives and the shirts on their backs. Right off of US 395, seven and a half miles south of Independence, California, is the Manzanar prison camp, where 10,000 of the newly imprisoned Japanese were housed. It's easy to say that it's not a concentration camp like the Nazis had concentration camps, and that is certainly true. Genocide was not the purpose. But these were US citizens who had done nothing wrong, who were only guilty of being Japanese at a time when people were afraid of what that might mean. The right to a trial, to defend themselves at that trial, to liberty, to property, was suspended like those rights meant nothing at all. And there were deaths. Infant mortality was high in the camps, on top of two deaths at a quote-unquote riot in December of 1942. A group had gathered at the gates to protest the arrest of a community leader. Tear gas was fired into the group, and when a truck began rolling toward the gates in the confusion, the guards opened fire. One young man, a teenager, was killed on the scene. Another young man later succumbed to a gut wound. Nine others were injured by the gunfire. The babies and the protesters are buried together in the Manzanar Cemetery, where a monument built in 1943 by an incarcerate named Rosio Cado dominates the scene. The writing on the front is supposed to translate as Soul Consoling Tower, but neither the words nor the despair behind it come through well in English. It's a powerful object, unforgettable against the beige, snow-capped mountains and the blowing dust. The community of Manzanar was actually quite remarkable in their ability to hang on to dignity and normalcy. They held dances, played baseball, put on shows, and even built intricate gardens with traditional Japanese waterworks and bridges. You might be familiar with a tune called Don't Fence Me In that was incredibly popular during the war. It was popular here at the camp, too. A Remembrance in the Visitor Center documentary has a man talking about how they played the song and danced to it almost defiantly, as a bitter irony. Most people in the camp believed in the American promise. That's why they'd immigrated in the first place. It was hard to keep a candle burning for liberty and justice for all when those candles had to be brought in on a military police truck through a barbed wire fence. Yet, many did. The most surprising thing about the Japanese who were imprisoned here is how many dusted themselves off, started new businesses, bought new houses, and kept on trying. After the war, all everyone got was $25 and a bus ticket. That was it. Even if they had lived there before, all Japanese Americans were barred from returning to California, Oregon, and Washington for years after the war ended. Hardly any of the buildings still remain in Manzanar, but once upon a war, there were 36 blocks of temporary housing here for 10,000 humans who didn't deserve to be there, but had no way to leave. In 2008, some of the camp's original detainees came back and helped excavate some of the old gardens that the Manzanar prisoners had built. They're the most striking thing in the camp. There's footage in the Visitor Center film that shows them with flowers in full bloom, grass at full green, but today it's concrete pools and rough-hewn bridges and the familiar configuration of Japanese gardens I'd seen elsewhere in places like Golden Gate Park or Balboa Park, down further south in California, places where these intricate and meticulously kept plantscapes function as Instagram backdrops more often than places of reflection in 2019. 
But here in wartime Manzanar, they were truly alternate realities, a way to find a place both within and without where they could be the people they remember being before coming here to an uncertain, years-long purgatory that only sees them as facelessly dangerous interlopers. A stone marker in the largest of the parks simply says, Pleasure Park, 1943. If we let it, Manzanar would quickly fade into weeds and obscurity. As a preserved historical park, Manzanar shames us to this day. And that's a good thing. Later on, I'd be in El Paso, Texas, the same week that news headlines were talking about immigrants detained for months in a makeshift prison underneath a freeway overpass. We've hurt people this way before. Japanese internment was such an obviously bipartisanly hypocritical thing for a supposedly free nation to do that it was conservative icon Ronald Reagan who in 1988 signed a Civil, Civil Liberties Act bill authorizing $20,000 of restitution to every surviving prisoner of Executive Order 9066. In 1992, George Bush I would sign a bill expanding the restitution budget to make sure that everyone eligible for that redress received it. The ethics of keeping innocent families in cages did not used to be something we were so willing to debate. Even the elder Bush, no friend to the left, had the common decency to say, quote, In remembering, it is important to come to grips with the past. No nation can fully understand itself or find its place in the world if it does not look with clear eyes at all the glories and disgraces of the past. We in the United States acknowledge such an injustice in our history. The internment of, Japanese, of Americans of Japanese ancestry was a great injustice, and it will never be repeated." End quote. The failures of America to adequately follow through on its promises of life and liberty are less likely to be repeated if we can still see the scars of those past cruelties and mistakes where that didn't happen, however distantly we can perceive them. It is painful to be at Manzanar and confront what was done, almost as painful as it is to admit that we have learned very little from it in the end. That's the peculiar tension at the heart of this Atomic Tour, and it gnawed on me as time went on and miles racked up. I thought that I would be just digging through the dust of history, but under the cobwebs is more often than not just a rust-modeled reflection of the present. As I drive towards Las Vegas to see the Smithsonian-run National Atomic Testing Museum, nuclear weapons dominate the headlines again for the first time in a long time. In February 2019, the U.S. withdrew from the 1987 INF Non-Proliferation Treaty. Just a month earlier in January, Russia had casually threatened the U.S. with a Poseidon superweapon, a nuclear bomb meant to be launched from a submarine, detonate along the coast, and then produce irradiated tsunamis that would topple cities and poison the earth for hundreds of miles inland. A popular mechanics article wonders if the weapon actually exists, but also points out that the work being done to retrofit Russian submarines to carry the doomsday torpedo is equally expensive no matter if the torpedo is real or fake, so it is likely to be a credible threat. At the Atomic Testing Museum, I read about an American weapon just as bizarre and disgusting. Project Pluto, also known as the Flying Crowbar. The Flying Crowbar is not an intercontinental ballistic missile, one of the ones that just goes up and comes down and blows up. Oh no. It's a cruise missile with an unshielded nuclear reactor powering a ramjet engine. This engine allowed it to be launched from the United States, fly at three times the speed of sound towards the Soviet Union, drop 12 hydrogen bombs, not just all at once, but one at a time as it passes by, and all the while producing a sonic boom shockwave of irradiated air in its wake. The missile poisons literally everything it touches, everything below it, and then the fallout from its passing drifts to places that the missile never even flew. A prototype of the flying crowbar was made up, and its extremely small reactor was made a concrete engineering reality, but it could never be fully tested without essentially being used as the weapon that it is. The reactor could never be turned off if turned on all the way and then released. It would poison anything, everything in its path, including NATO countries and other allies on the way to the Soviet Union. Like the Russian Poseidon torpedo, it straddles the line between morbid scientific fact and sadistic engineering fantasy. Everything about Project Pluto theoretically worked, but you'd never know all the way until you tried, and trying would murder millions of people. 
The bedrock principle of mutually assured destruction I can begrudgingly understand. It's an atomic stalemate that keeps the peace from snapping. But these weapons are just psychopathic, going beyond strategic need into the realm of petulant genocide. The idea behind them is that being Russian, or American, or Chinese is so important that it's better for all civilizations to disappear and all life to die, rather than suffer the defeat and disappearance of your own particular civilization. These doomsday weapons are apocalyptic temper tantrums. They seem so deeply absurd that it almost absolves them of what they are, the in-for-a-penny, in-for-a-pound mentality applied to the end of the world. I mean, if we're already using nukes, why not? We would already be transgressing against the survival of our planet and our peoples. Don't be such a damn prude about it, and make that defilement as total as possible. Deeper into the museum, I came face to face with the bomb itself. Well, bomb casing, anyway. But it was the real deal. It was large, as big as I expected as an object, but much bigger than that in its presence. A solid thing, meant to disintegrate so violently that it burns away and tears apart everything from miles around it. The most dangerous thing in the world. The metal was smooth and cool to the touch, it was elegantly machined. It was real. It wasn't just the articles I had read and the media I had consumed. A certain part of me thought that seeing the bomb in person would be like any other museum experience, intellectual, domesticated. Instead, it was like looking at a taxidermied mountain lion, its teeth gleaming in the spotlights, before a long walk home through the dark woods. This one was harmless. Stuffed. Outside the museum's doors, the live ones are waiting somewhere in the shadowy trees. In other instances, the past and future diverge in very strange ways. Elsewhere in the museum was a large exhibit on underground atomic testing, with a particular set of plaques focusing on something called Project Plowshare. This one I knew about. I had a stop planned at one of the Plowshare detonation sites, the gas buggy test that took place in New Mexico's Carson National Forest, much further down the road. You might have read in the news about the prevalence today of fracking as a mining method, the method of busting up rocks to free natural gas deposits and other resources by using high-pressure liquid to burst those rock formations along their seams while still underground. Well, modern fracking was directly preceded by the spectacular failure of Project Plowshare. Plowshare attempted to use a nuclear detonation instead of water pressure to do the same fracking thing. Let me hand it over briefly to this video that the Atomic Energy Commission produced back in the day to try and sell the idea. To perform a multitude of peaceful tasks for the betterment of mankind, man is exploring a source of enormous, potentially useful energy, the nuclear explosion. He sees the potentials, and he sees the problems. To investigate both and to develop the technology that will turn potentials into realities, the United States is conducting, for the benefit of all nations, a program it calls Plowshare. How can the recovery of natural resources be increased to meet man's ever-growing needs? Plowshare underground engineering may be one of the answers. Nuclear explosions deep underground break and splinter huge areas of rock. These massive effects may permit highly promising recovery of resources that have been impossible or economically impractical to extract from the earth. By digging tunnels deep into the explosive region, Plowshare teams have been able to examine and evaluate the effects of underground engineering with nuclear explosives. Effects achieved with various explosive yields in various types of rock. Industries and research institutes in the United States and in various parts of the world have recognized many potential uses for Plowshare underground engineering. So I went looking for the Project Gas Buggy site, along with my friend Nate, who had flown out to El Paso to join me for that later leg of the trip. The roads out here are so tiny that even Google Maps don't track them very well, supposing you could even get reception on your phone to check. In my atlas, these roads don't show up at all. So Nate and I made a fateful gamble. 
We drove out a Forest Service road on the border between the Apache Reservation and the Carson National Forest. The road was terrible, one of the worst I'd ever seen, so we turned around. Here was the gamble. There was a teenager in a big old 4x4 pickup truck idling a quarter mile down the road. We decided to ask him for directions, and he told us that we had gotten the right road in the first place. We should continue on down the bad road. Later on, I sweated over Google Maps to figure out what had gone wrong. Learn from my mistake. Take the reservation road J10, seven and a half miles down through the Apache side of the forest, before turning west into the Carson National Forest. There's an option to take a turn going into the Carson almost right away. This is the road I took. This is the road you should not take. The road got worse and worse, but I was certain, certain, that if I just pressed through the through line of it, it would come back around to the main highway. It was supposed to, after a time, from what I had read. Maybe the road I thought it was actually does. This road, this godforsaken goat-fucking-goat trail, goes straight up a mountain into the mud and then goes straight up an even taller mountain, while bigger and bigger rocks and ruts slice up the road's surface like the scarred and pitted face of an old boxer. The footage I took doesn't even touch how bad it got. I was honestly afraid to have footage in case I tipped the bus over entirely and had to make some kind of insurance claim. I knew I was fucking up, and the idea of a permanent record of that idiocy made me pretty queasy. Yet I pressed on. I had the strong notion that my idea was going to pan out. Had to pan out. I had already invested so much. Project Plowshare was managed in much the same way. Across its various atomic fracking tests, two things became clear. One is that, yeah, it sort of worked. Some natural gas deposits quadrupled in yield. The second thing is that when the accounting was done, they had spent $80 million creating nuclear infernos under the deep deserts of the Four Corners region, and even if they were able to sell all the extra natural gas they had freed up, they would still only recoup maybe a third of that expense, optimistically. Pragmatically, a whopping 0% of that natural gas yield could be taken to market because it was all completely irradiated. Can you imagine hooking up fuel to a camp stove and having the flame burn a slightly different hue, seasoned with just a hint of fissionable material? The rise of hydraulic fracking came about partly because the plowshare experiments proved that it was a viable idea to frack the earth into submission, just not a viable method to use atomic bombs to do it. On its own merits, the endeavor was a complete failure, as was my attempt to actually find the site of the Project Gas Buggy detonation. I did, though, succeed at going up and down the same kind of incline that Kathy Bates sent Whoopi Goldberg tumbling over in the movie Rat Race without destroying my bus, my sanity, or my friendship with Nate. Thanks for being understanding, pal. It's an alright thing to have missed compared to the excitement of the detour, but somewhere, very nearby where I was here in the New Mexico sagebrush, is a quiet meadow under which sits a smoldering pit of radioactive heat. The only thing to mark it, I'm told, is a Forest Service plaque and a large sign that says, Do Not Dig. A couple days after leaving the Atomic Testing Museum and about two weeks before I nearly hooned my bus into oblivion on my quest for gas buggy, I got to see firsthand something a lot rarer and more impactful than some atomic bomb casing or a piddly little radioactive meadow. A little outside Tucson, the rocky foothills used to be dotted with small, square patches of fenced government land. Nothing on top but a large concrete slab, an elevator, and a staircase. Underneath those mysterious government squares are Titan II intercontinental ballistic missiles in their command centers, the fuel waiting to be mixed on word from the powers that be. Between 1963 and 1987, 18 silos in the Tucson area patiently collected dust preparing for the end of the world. Now, only this one, in Sahuarita, remains. It's a museum these days, and the number one thing the guides will tell you, over and over during your tour, is that the success of the Titan II program is that it was never used at all, not for war, and not even, even once in error. In the early 60s, this was some of the most advanced technology around. The Titan II program was the first computerized military system in the world. The Titan II rockets helped get us to the moon, in the silos, though, the navigational computer was programmed weekly with three possible targets down here on Earth. The men and later women who operated the silo never knew what the targets were. They only knew when orders came down to choose one of the targets and launch. The Minuteman program that replaced the Titan missiles had smaller, more advanced ballistics which could hit military targets with great precision. 
The Titans were generally accurate to within a mile or maybe half a mile, but make no mistake, these were colossal Armageddon devices and were aimed mostly at large cities with large nuclear payloads. This is why these silos were preferentially staffed with the young from 18 to 21, because studies showed that the longer someone was in the military, the more that they had seen of war, the less likely they would actually obey a launch order. A two-man policy meant that no one could ever be alone, anywhere, at any time within the silo, and it was your duty to report on your co-workers for any hesitation or unprofessionalism. Once the missiles were launched, they could never be recalled. Once the keys are turned, two keys at once, far enough apart to need two people to do it, held for four seconds and then released, the world is already ended. Now, it's the fire of the missile's engines, but in 30 minutes' time, it'll be the payload on the front end that ignites in an inferno that will kill tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, depending on if it hits the clinically anonymous Target 1, Target 2, or Target 3. But you don't have to listen to me explain it. Why don't you watch me do it instead while our tour guide, a former silo commander herself back in the early 80s, explains in detail as the console goes through a simulated progression of how a nuclear launch would appear to the silo crew. On your command, Commander, we're going to do it. Get ready. Okay. Three, two, one, launch. Turn. Okay, forward. Three, two, one. It's going to let go. We have started something we cannot stop. You see launch enable, which means, among other things, the butterfly valve is unlocked. Now we've got batteries activated. On board the missile, there are two batteries that have been dry. They're now being force-fed electrolytes. It'll take 28 seconds, but they'll come up to power, and the missile will have its own power supply. It won't need the complex anymore. APS power will come on at that time, meaning accessory power is available. The next slide after that is silo soft. Silo door is rolling open. We can't hear it or see it, but it's going to roll for the tipsies, and they're going to do what they would do if anything went through them. They're going to say, hey, listen. the next thing we're going to get is guidance go. Guidance in here and the guidance on board, the computer's talking. I know where I am, know where I'm going, and what I'm going to do. And now we're going to fire the engines. Flames are shooting out, water spraying, steam is building. We're going to get indications of fire alarm systems because we have a fire in the launch door. We should have a fire in the launch door. Four seconds later, Commander, what does that say? Lift off. Lift off. That missile is gone. 35 minutes from now, Target 2 is not going to be a very good place to be. It is going to be totally destroyed. We turn off things that came on power down equipment and wait for incoming missiles. For further guidance, which we may or may not get because we don't really have a job anymore. Our job is over. We've done what we were trained to do. We've got 30 days of food and water down below, but we're going to run out of air before that because we closed the blast valve and this is like being in a submarine. And then at some point we might want to say, when we can't breathe very well anymore, do you want to suffocate or do you want to go topside to a nuclear holocaust? Not good choices. That's all it takes to kill a world. About five pounds of pressure, if that, held for four seconds with your left hand. That we all made it through the Cold War at all was amazing when you think about it. It often feels like the old cliche that Russians and Americans are holding cocked and loaded guns to each other's heads is silly and has been for decades, and it's kind of a figure of speech. It is actually flatly literal and still absolutely accurate down to this minute. We're far enough apart that the bullets take half an hour to arrive. That's enough distance to mentally mitigate the perception of danger. Oh, it's war. War is slow. War is something that happens far away to other people. It isn't. War at home is simply dormant. For 24 years, war sat crouched in 18 deep metal pits outside of Tucson, Arizona, waiting to vault from the ground, sail through the air, and seize the throat of the Earth we've known. Apocalypse already came calling many centuries ago for the ancestral Sonoran tribes who once lived in the same part of Arizona that the Titan Silo sits in now. Going back to the years contemporary with when the Romans still occupied England, people have lived, hunted, and built cities out here in the unchanging cactus land. American education, especially grade school education, teaches a very simplified view of the native peoples. It il illustrates them as nomads, peoples of the horse, peoples of the plain, simple folk with no real mastery of science or architecture, which are suggested to be European imports. 
That is wildly inaccurate up and down. For a long period lasting about 800 common era to 1400 common era, the southwest was filled with experimental, intricately designed cities completely unlike anything the European or upcoming American civilizations would produce. Cities in the cliffs, cities on the plains, all across hundreds of years and thousands of miles, with massive regional variation in architectural style and purpose. And then, all those cities and towns were abandoned so completely that no descendant of those tribes even knows what the city builders called themselves. They're the ancestors, the old ones, the ancients. The town of Casa Grande, Arizona, is named after what we call one of these crumbling cities. The O'odham tribe called it Sawan Wa'aki, a four-story tall great house surrounded by a 2,000-person strong community of smaller buildings, common areas, and sport ball courts. Seriously, they had some kind of game with two teams and a rubber ball that they played in a big oval arena, but the specific rules are lost to time. The most significant differences between European and Sonoran civilization seems to be population density and written language. Sonoran cultures had, on average, far less people in a given community, with communities spread much wider apart. The civilizations of the first people began nomadically and would largely return to those ways during the time that Europeans encountered them, but during the Pueblo periods, the American Southwest was becoming urbanized in a way that often comes as a real surprise to people like me, who got the, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue approach to history, wherein the first American city was built by white folks in Massachusetts. By 1492, Suwan Wa'aki had been abandoned for 50 years. European colonization of the continent began while the Sonoran civilization was suffering from a kind of cataclysmic decline, one that drove almost every tribe and people who had been developing cities away from them. Without written language quite the way the Europeans, or even, say, the Japanese had it, the architectural techniques that built the Casa Grande community and others were largely lost when the tribes fled the cities, never to return to an urban life. The culture of those tribes was lost over time as well, splintering and changing as decades went on into the O'odham, the Hopi, the Zuni. Other tribes splintered off of other formerly urbanized people in other parts of the southwest. No one knows what Sawan Wa'aki was truly meant to be. No one knows all the way why all these beautiful and resilient structures were so totally abandoned for so many generations after the fall. And no one remembers how you're supposed to play Sonoran sport ball. Given time, would the tribes have eventually urbanized again? It's impossible to say. Maybe the post-Pueblo period was a dark age that they'd have eventually come out the other side of. It's too late now in any case to tell. The suburbs of Casa Grande, the modern American city, have reached out to surround the property, and the size of Suwan Wa'aki is dwarfed by any given Walmart of today. The structure itself is protected under a canopy built in the 1930s that feels equally misplaced in time, along with structural stabilizations that mix some modern materials into the ancient ruin. It's meant to keep the ruins from being further eroded by sun and rain, but one day both Casa and Canopy will finally erode to nothing. But by the time that happens, maybe it'll be America whose name is forgotten, and it'll be our works, our office buildings, and our Taco Bells that are seen as the mysterious follies of the ancients by the wandering tribes of our descendants. Continuing eastward from the Titan II Missile Museum and the Sonoran's vanished empire is the site of one of the very last chapters in the history of the free native civilizations. In 1871, the Apache leader Cochise was holed up with the last of his war party in the Dragoon Mountains of extreme southeastern Arizona. While Cochise never lost a battle, his was a war that was never really winnable. His charge was 250 fighting men against the tide of self-declared manifest destiny. The mountains here are beautiful, the boulders tremendous and looming. It's a fine place to make a last stand. But Cochise didn't have to, it didn't end in blood. In 1872, Cochise signed a treaty, spending the rest of his life on a reservation before finally dying of cancer. When it came time to bury him, he wanted to be buried here, in these hills somewhere, the last place that he was defiantly free. His is a story that's equally melancholy and evocative. It hits on so many of the narrative notes that Americans love in a Western story. A good man pushed too hard, pushing back until the end, and then laying down his guns to save his children. A man who loved the land and hated the government. In 1950, one of the first westerns to ever center around a native protagonist was made about Cochise in his final days, a movie called Broken Arrow. 
Of course, to get 1950s audiences to be sympathetic to an Apache, they did cast him with a New Yorker. But still, narratively, Cochise's story embodies too much of what we understand to be the spirit of individualistic frontier America to be wholly made the villain like so many of his peers were. The Cochise stronghold is only 60 miles of driving away from perhaps the most internationally famous and recognizable town of the American West, Tombstone, Arizona. Some ghost towns are forgotten, some are museum towns, and some, a select few, are able to leverage some facet of their older selves into a profitable distortion and become tourist towns. Tombstone is the most profitable and most distorted of them all. Firstly, it is not a ghost town. Almost 1,400 people live there. For this part of Arizona, that is a fairly medium-sized town. What Tombstone has done is preserve its oldest neighborhood as a kind of theme park. Paid actors stroll the streets in period clothing, from bow-tied gunfighters to provocatively corseted saloon girls. You've got a dozen western wear shops, none of which will sell you so much as a button-up shirt for less than $40. There are boutiques everywhere, from places selling steampunk cosplay equipment to the especially preposterous Ye Old Western Artisanal Vinegar Shop. They reenact the gunfight at the OK Corral every hour on the hour. The saloons all have cutesy names like Big Nose Kates, and they're absolutely packed with sunsetters tying one on before a shopping spree of frontier knickknacks. Tombstone is frustrating as a ghost town aficionado because it's an idea of a ghost town turned into a commercial product by sanitizing the decay and sensationalizing the history. The only part of the town that's well and truly strange and forgotten is a tourist attraction itself, the Historama. It's a gigantic rotating diorama telling the town's history, narrated by none other than Vincent Price. I asked the guy selling tickets how long they were going to keep running the Historama, and he said, until it breaks, man, which could be a long, long while. The narration is, tonally, perfect for what the town of Tombstone actually is. Price's sinister voice contorts into almost a winking drawl as fact weaves into fiction wherever it lets Price tell a better, more violent, more shocking story. Tombstone isn't along a convenient route like most touristy ghost towns. You have to go deliberately. People do come, though, on the strength and reach of the town's story. The most famous depiction of the Tombstone myth is, of course, Tombstone with Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer. It's a good yarn, told well, with a real sense of fun from Russell and Kilmer, but if you're like me, you've probably got just one burning question in the back of your mind after watching it. What the hell happened to Pharaoh? The Old West Gambling Hall's premier attraction isn't blackjack or poker or roulette. No, Kurt Russell runs a Pharaoh table. It's a sequence-guessing single-deck card game from 17th century France played cooperatively against a dealer like blackjack, but with a broader range of betting, maybe kind of more like craps. The reason it disappeared seems to be that it has an extremely low house edge. It's damn close to a true 50-50 proposition, and that's just not good enough for a modern casino. Pharaoh's popularity also dwindled massively in the post-World War I era over frustration with its vulnerability to dealers cheating the players with misshuffled decks. By the time I was born, the game was completely extinct. The very last Pharaoh table in America was being dealt at the Ramada Casino in Reno in 1985. Tombstone tries to cash in in every way it can with its frontier legacy and tall tale stretcher, and as a result, the town is a living thing today, and Pharaoh is not. The trick is that what Tombstone is today doesn't remotely resemble what it was then. Sure, the buildings are the same, some of the history is true, but the place is a mall, with a real town lurking outside the boardwalked area. They've got shows and shops and restaurants. The yearly tourist population is larger than the local population, of 1,400, by a ratio of 300 to 1. Whether you're selling Stetson hats, ice cream, mine tours, or tickets to a gunfighter museum, there is someone willing to pay for it, showing up all seasons of the year. The place used to live off of the mines, off of rocks in the ground, but it slowly grew around its legend like a vine on a lattice, monetizing people's longing for a bygone era of rough and tumble adventure. Then, when the seekers arrive, the town wraps them in modern comforts and sells them trinkets to commemorate their search. In this town, you'll have better luck finding a faro table than you will going out looking for the windswept desolation of the Old West. Tombstone is a costume drama, reenacted daily for as long as the power of the story endures. 
There are some stories that I don't think get told very often because it's difficult to explain what you've even seen, and that applies very strongly to one of the least visited, most amazing desert parks of the American Southwest, Shirakawa National Monument. 27 million years ago, just south of the park, a volcano exploded with such force that it left a 12-mile-wide caldera and tossed up enough ash and pumice into the air that when all that stuff came back down again, it formed a layer of rock called rhyolite tuff that was 2,000 feet thick. Utah's famous Bryce Canyon has these enormous pinnacles and spires of eroded sandstone that form a kind of hedge maze of ancient seabed in a jagged valley. Shirakawa is very similar, but instead of a sandstone, it's this volcanic rhyolite that's been eroded down into a forest of strange gray stacks, all covered with a light green lichen that gives them an especially forgotten and weathered appearance. Shirakawa is a little more humble and a little less severe of a landscape than Bryce Canyon, but certainly no less of an exotic one, with the added benefit of being eerily empty. I've just never seen anything like it at all, and I'd never even heard of the place before deciding to go there. It just happened to be right on the way from Tombstone to Trinity. Yet, I think Shirakawa is one of the most fascinating, unforgettable things I've ever seen. It took 26 million years for wind, rain, earthquakes, and frost to break this landscape apart into the glorious confusion it is today. The dog and I walked all through much of it, down through the mineral forest of Echo Canyon and up the other side into the heart of the rocks, where the trail makes dramatic scrambles to get up to the strangest, densest part of the formations. It's completely alien, a slice of landscape scooped up from Alpha Centauri and deposited 50 miles off the interstate in southern Arizona. It's one of what the Park Service calls Sky Islands, areas of the Sonoran Desert that tower above the desert floor by so many thousands of feet that the climate is different. It's cool and moist enough to allow small forests and pockets of life quite different from anything down below on the desert floor. Shirakawa feels so secretive in the way you take these obscure byways, for an hour at least, slowly climbing, moving from sand to shrub, and then suddenly to mountains, trees, and then these spires of compacted ash from countless eons ago. Human time feels so inadequate for appreciating this kind of place. It feels like a long time ago that people used landline telephones, so it's absolutely ancient to look back at the tombstone days, which are nothing compared to the time of the Sonoran civilizations, which are themselves just a tiny blip on the long crawl back to when this part of Arizona was a volcano-blackened hellscape. All of these epochs, large and small, sit within a day's drive of each other, when not layered one directly on top of the other. Before going to the Trinity site, I needed to make a stop on El Paso to pick up my friend Nate from the airport there so he could come with and spend his spring break from college with me in the bus. Ever since we were friends in high school, we had wanted to come see the Trinity site, but it had never worked out before. Life often makes it tricky to land two people in the same spot on the same day, especially so when that spot is in extreme rural New Mexico. So instead of going directly to Alamogordo, I drove New Mexico State Route 9 along the Mexican border. Along the way, the only traffic I passed was law enforcement. Every mile or so, there was another border patrol vehicle where there weren't military-style command units with big antennas and dishes sprouting up from them. I hadn't yet been anywhere so devoid of towns and infrastructure, but filled with paranoid activity. It was strange to think of myself as being constantly watched after being so long in places where only the deer and foxes gave a damn. I was heading for Columbus, New Mexico, a sleepy town whose city limit extends right up to the borderline. Puerto Palomas, an equally sleepy town, extends southward from there on the Mexican side. Today, about 1,600 people live in Columbus. Not much has happened there for the past hundred years. But a little over a hundred years ago, on March 6, 1916, it was a different story. On that day, Columbus became the last place in America to be invaded by foreign troops and burnt to the ground. In the pre-dawn, a little after four in the morning, 600 men under the command of Pancho Villa struck the cavalry garrison in Columbus and then proceeded to loot the town. Villa himself was camped three miles to the south in Mexico with 900 more horses and men. Villa's troops burned everything down, shooting local townsfolk who took up armies against them and sometimes just taking pot shots in general at anyone. In a museum there, a video features a woman, very old in the footage, which is itself captured on an old VHS, talking about how she was 12 years old when the raid happened. She fled into the brush with her mother, where they were fired on repeatedly while their home was lit ablaze. An old Dodge car elsewhere in the museum is full of bullet holes from a family attempting an escape down Main Street that was ultimately successful. It was only when the cavalrymen were able to mount and troubleshoot two modern machine guns that Villa's retreat was sounded. 
Those two guns fired 5,000 rounds each lit by the fires of the burning town. All in all, it was a very serious, if small, act of war. This action prompted a retaliatory expedition where General Pershing led a punitive campaign down into Mexico with the aim of capturing Villa. It was a failure, Villa got away, but this forgotten border war was an incredibly important transitional moment for 20th century America. It was simultaneously the very last official cavalry action by the U.S. Army, while also being the very first in which the Army deployed motorized vehicles. Since supply lines in the Mexican desert were thin, donkey caravans carried fuel for the trucks. Prototype APCs, like the one outside the museum, were brought down, although they never ended up being deployed in the campaign. When World War I would consume the globe in a couple years, a lot of money had already been put into making the American military a mechanized, industrialized force, and it was this deadly serious but historically obscure border conflict that spurred much of that spending in the pre-World War I days. Pershing would command much of the American war machine in the Great War. This was his warm-up. In some pictures in the museum, a young General Patton can be seen. No general then. But when Patton took his tank command to North Africa in World War II, it was this experience as part of the first mechanized action in U.S. history in the hot Chihuahuan desert that informed his approach, even if distantly. Small things have long echoes. Columbus was a smaller town then, only 300 people, and it's still small today. It's changed very little compared to the world around it. But the modern world's overall shape is pivotally, critically connected to Columbus, New Mexico, and that strange firelit morning in 1916. From the campground at Pancho Villa State Park, you can see the border crossing like the bright lights of a distant casino. Every time after that on my trip, when I would hear about the border wall, all the bullshit reasons to justify its expense, I would think back to Columbus. Against Pancho Villa's 600-man-strong cavalry raid, maybe a wall would have been some sort of deterrent, supposing they were short on ladders at the time. But that was the last time, and even in 1916, a cavalry charge was a dated approach. That was the last cavalry action by any nation over here the last true invasion of the U.S. The people crossing the border today aren't vaqueros with six guns and repeaters. They're families. They're women and children and fathers and brothers. People talk about the border today like Pancho Villa is still alive and still fixing to burn down some little home on the prairie. He's dead. That era is dead. Villa was old when Patton was young, and now Patton and his era are dead too. The only thing that stayed constant is the water tower in the middle of town, silently standing at the border of America and Mexico, past and future. Two days and half a state later, Nate, Maybe, and I are waiting in an hour-long, 200-car line to have our IDs checked and be allowed onto the White Sands Missile Range. I had it in my mind for some reason that the Trinity Open House would be uncrowded, especially getting there a little before opening. No such luck. It turns out that the two days a year the Trinity site is publicly accessible are capital letter events with professors and potheads and Boy Scout troops all turning out in force to see whatever's left of that pivotal moment in history. Before we look at what's left, though, let's look at what happened with some footage of the bomb courtesy of YouTube channel Adam Central. Of that violence, very little actually remains at the site. The only piece of meaningful rubble is a chunk of what they called the Jumbo, a thick bomb housing they elected not to use for the test and instead stood on a tower some 800 feet away from the point of detonation. That blast tore the Jumbo apart like a cartoon firecracker, and then the heat melted massive droplets out of the metal as it was hurling through the air. This thing weighs tons, and yet it was ruined and burned as easy as a cardboard toilet paper tube on the edge of a campfire. The radio activity has faded, as it has at most of the site. I had ordered an antique Geiger counter off of eBay to measure it myself, but I couldn't get it to register anything. There was actually a Geiger counter display as we were walking towards the site, so I asked the guy there if my thing worked or not. He laughed and said, 
Number one, that thing's older than both of us put together. Number two, it's not sensitive enough. The civil defense meters were for wartime use. They only ever measured large amounts. You'd need a much more sensitive one to pick up anything today. He had a display of trinitite, the atomic glass that was created when the heat of the nuclear blast fused the New Mexican soil together into molten droplets that fell like rain. Like the jumbo, they're harmless today. There used to be a large display of trinitite on the ground, but the shelter was shuttered and locked when we were there. Apparently, it's no longer shown to the public. What there is to see is an obelisk. It's a modest but melancholy thing, made of black igneous stones with a simple, straightforward plaque affixed to the front. Against the open desert alone, it would make a macabre and evocative sight, but instead it's up against dozens and hundreds of folks taking an endless stream of selfies. The atmosphere is loud and carefree, with kids yelling and running around, old folks making jokes that their families refuse to acknowledge, and everyone, everywhere, taking as many pictures as they can, including me. Hell, Nate and I even hit up the gift shop trailer. Can't go to the birthplace of the modern age without laying down $20 for the t-shirt, after all. The thing is that the weight of where you are and what it means gets shockingly diluted by the county fair manner that everyone's carrying on in. The desert has rushed back in and filled a lot of the crater that the bomb had left. The Trinity site is several feet lower than the rest of the desert floor still, but decades have made that difference gradual and hard to perceive. The weight of what happened is all that's left. The obelisk does convey a lot of it, but as the only thing by which to mark that someone was there at all, it's hard enough to even get close to it through all the picture takers. A bomb casing, of the variety dropped on Nagasaki, sits on an otherwise unremarkable trailer with a laminated sign. It took me 26 days of hard driving to arrive at the Trinity site. I had dreamed about coming here for years, but I had dreamed about it as a lonely and wild thing. On the one hand, you've got to be passionate about the thing to even make the journey out here to such a true backwater in the first place. On the other hand, the photo-hungry crowd robs the place of much of its mystery. Its uniquely violent history is caged and diminished, like a dragon in a trailer from a traveling circus. I had come a long, long way to witness the Trinity site. In doing so, I was part of the same crowd that I was frustrated with. License plates in the parking lot are from all over the country. Minnesota, Florida, Maine. Pilgrims all to come so far to see so little. An obelisk in a minor, dusty depression on an active airbase smack dab at the middle of New Mexico. A metal tube with deep wounds. A truck with artifacts to see, a truck with trinkets to buy. I expected more, I think. I had built it up in my mind somehow, but into what? The power of the bomb was a surface wound on the desert. Its deepest impact was on the shape of the future and not the shape of the land. Now the sands and weeds have resumed dominion over this place. The radioactive poison has faded with time. And you know, if I had any sense, maybe I'd take that as a comfort. That the ultimate destination was a little underwhelming means nothing compared to the full experience of all I had seen on the way to Trinity and all I had yet to see coming home. At Trinity, I had made the big pivot back towards the Northwest, but in between me and Seattle was some of the most sparsely inhabited, infrequently discussed land in the nation. Its isolation is why all the exciting science happens out here. No city lights, no one around to shock or injure. Farther to the northwest from Trinity, Nate and I passed by the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array, where it sits on the plains of Augustin. The array is one of the world's premier radio telescopes, every dish mounted on double railroad tracks to be adjusted for different scientific tasks. It was too late in the day to take a tour, but passing by was quite a thing in itself. This is one of the tools that humans as a global species use to make sense of the greater universe around us, to perceive and attempt to solve mysteries that our ancestors never had the scientific or spoken vocabulary to even ask. It's a radio wave window peering from the American frontier up to the final one. Further east from the very large array, you arrive at Pie Town, New Mexico, where you have your pick of three competing pie restaurants. Seriously, I recommend the Pioneer myself. Then, moving northwest more, deeper into the New Mexican wilderness, you pass by El Moro. While the monument was shut down and its trail closed when I went there, the place had been a watering hole for travelers going back centuries. There's petroglyphs and graffiti on the rock going back from the 1950s through the first American settlers to the Zuni and then farther back into forgotten ancestors of the First Peoples. 
It stands on the edge of El Malpai, a gigantic volcanic plain that covers much of this part of the state. Trinity's humble and simple obelisk in the barely perceptible edges of its crater had put some things into perspective, at least. First off, if all it takes is a little over half a century to bury an atomic bomb blast under the sands, how much insane force must volcanoes erupt with if they're able to leave scars on the landscape that last thousands of years? If everyone in your party has $12, make a right at the cartoon prospector off Ice Cave Road between El Moro and El Melpai to see one of the most impressive volcanic calderas I've seen in the West. Bandera Mountain exploded into an all-consuming inferno some 10,000 years ago, almost yesterday in geologic time. As a result, the surrounding lava fields are especially ragged and raw, even after all this time. The kind of erosion that created the spires at Shurakawa has barely even begun here. All this stuff is still jagged to the touch. The volcano today is 800 feet deep, with tiny trees clinging to the incline at what seem like impossible angles. Nearby is the Mandera Ice Cave, a cave formed by the cooling lava that had just the right properties to stay under freezing temperatures year-round, no matter how hot the dark igneous soil became under the bright New Mexican sun. Some of the ice in the cave is 30 feet deep, with the bottom layer of ice having first frozen some 2,000 years ago. Some layers of ice were mined for use by the settlers, but once that practice was stopped, the cave filled up again with new ice. This part of the state is filled with wonders and contrasts, both man-made and natural. It's got high technology, ancient ice, young lava fields, novelty towns, and we hadn't even driven to the crowning jewel of all of them. The grandest, largest city of pre-colonial America, abandoned now for 800 years. Chaco Canyon National Historic Park has ruins that surpass in size and complexity the famous cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde National Park up the road in Colorado, but I had never heard a single word about them in my life. I only discovered them by googling things in my atlas, and Chaco Canyon's Park Service website immediately hits you with this picture of a crescent-shaped structure that is just jaw-droppingly bizarre and beautiful. It's just one of 15 major structures up and down the canyon, many of them numbering in the hundreds of rooms and thousands of inhabitants back in the day. These were the largest, most advanced structures built in America before the 19th century. Even the early Bostonians didn't make single, cohesive structures this massive until industrialization began to transform the nation. They are truly every bit the equal of European castles, with the significant difference of having no defensive features, instead focusing on communal meeting and workspaces within the large round kivas that feature so prominently in the architectural style. Like Casa Grande, they stretched up to three and four stories tall, but Casa Grande is a backwater compared to this. Chaco Canyon, from 900 Common Era to about 1150 Common Era, was the most advanced and urbanized civilization north of the Incas and Mayans of South America. A small civilization, sure, but when I tell you that Chaco Canyon is a lost city, that's exactly what it was. These megastructures, the Great Houses, are most of what remains, but the entire canyon would have been filled with other, more temporary structures that wind and rain have eroded away. A drought began in 1130 that lasted about 50 years, and out here in the Four Corners area, water is already precious in times of plenty. This large of a population couldn't all live in one place with the river running dry for five decades straight. It would be like Los Angeles without its aqueduct. Chaco Canyon without the river running through the middle was doomed to death by dehydration. No water, no civilization. And so the city dwellers went to wandering again, becoming the Hopi and the modern Pueblo peoples. Civilization is an incredibly delicate thing. The tribes of the Southwest weren't nomadic because they were too simple to conceive any other way. They were nomadic because cities, for them, had been a spectacular failure. They were great while they lasted, but they didn't last very well out here. The Southwest is a land of total scarcity. If you're mobile, you can chase what resources there are. When you've got 5,000 people doing specialized tasks dependent on a steady flow of resources for survival, and then those resources dry up for an entire generation or more, well, that's it. Cash it out, city over. Had circumstances been different, maybe Chaco Canyon would be filled with adobe-packed skyscrapers by now. Circumstances being what they are, the descendants of those who built the city would chase their own survival until what was known became lost again. 
Chaco Canyon would have been the New York of its day, with trade routes stretching so far as to bring in shells from the coast and send out turquoise jewelry and processed obsidian to communities that are thousands of miles distant. Generations expanded the structures that they grew up in, doubling them in size, tripling them, making new great houses in the new styles that they were experimenting with. Strolling through Chaco Canyon is overwhelming, not just for the scale and beauty of the ruins, but for wondering at what feels like such a small amount of time that the city was alive and vibrant. 250 years. There are towns on the East Coast that have been around for as long as that by now. Native culture and history stretches so far backwards and so far forwards from the time the city lived without encountering anything else like it in the record. It was a blip, historically, culturally. I have trouble understanding that somehow. Progress is such an understood value to me, and a certain kind of American technological progress at that, that the idea of rejecting urbanization as a dead-end path feels almost taboo. Especially after something like this. How could the great-grandchildren of the city builders, their great-grandchildren after that, not walk among the ruins and feel a longing for them, a kind of deep reflexive nostalgia in watching the sun shine off the stacked rock walls? Maybe they did. Certainly they must have from time to time. But those feelings never drove any tribe to replicate the city's like again. Among this delicate decay, I am equally as lost in my thoughts as I am in the hallways. This is the Pueblo Benito, so named by the conquistadors who pursued the Navajo through the canyon in the late 1600s. There are dozens of rooms accessible to the public, but the complex in its prime had over 650 rooms total, over four stories, not even getting into the many round kivas. The half-moon megastructure competes with the Roman Colosseum for size and engineering complexity, but as a primarily residential structure, it housed 1,200 people instead of great arenas and hidden catacombs. Again, this is only one of several structures between one and 700 rooms that you'll find here in Chaco Canyon. The doorways are all low, and had the roof been intact, many of the rooms, especially here on the first level, would have been incredibly dark. Even confined to the first floor, most of the wood long since rotted away that would have allowed access to higher in the structure, it's still possible for a visitor to get completely turned around. Nate and I, after a lot of astonished conversation at first, felt quiet as we wandered and soon went in separate directions. It took us ten minutes at least to find each other again. We were calling out loudly, but the thickness of the walls and the heights they climbed to absorbed all of our cries. It wasn't until we were only one room apart that we actually heard each other. The Pueblo is labyrinthine in a way that I have rarely seen anywhere, dense with rooms and geometric flourishes packed in tighter than anything a modern American architect would ever draft. Pueblo Benito was one of the oldest structures in Chaco Canyon, and it was expanded many times over several hundred years to reach the size it is, or was, today. Other structures, remarkably, were planned and constructed almost all at once, and then only inhabited for a hundred years or so, like the Chetro Kettle ruins that sit ne next door a quarter mile's walk away. Tretro Kettle was a 550-room structure itself, taking an estimated 50 million stone blocks and 5,000 trees to complete. The wood is actually the most remarkable thing. Do you see any trees out here in the desert? The trees, again, 5,000 trees alone for just one of the many great houses, had to come from hundreds of miles away, as far south as El Malpai and as far north as Colorado. All of that infrastructure and willpower had to be there before the city was even built to get the materials out there. And then the streams of those resources had to persist over generations. On scene here, because it's closed to the public, is a special small ruin on top of a nearby butte. A spiral petroglyph is marked in the floor of a hollow in the rock. From far above, a small, brilliant shaft of light illuminates a golden slash on part of the spiral. Depending on when in the year it's observed, this light, called the Sun Dagger, marks the summer and winter solstices along with the vernal and autumnal equinox. In 1989, the rock shifted and this effect was permanently destroyed, but luckily it was recorded and documented by an artist named Anna Sothair in 1977. Hundreds of years, almost a thousand, this lonely butte sat quiet, and only in the last twelve years it was possible to see the Sun Dagger was the Sun Dagger discovered at all. In 1050 AD, this was one of the most scientifically advanced and exciting places in the entire world to be living. 
Now it's one of the most remote national monuments in America, with a 20-mile dirt road either direction required to access it. It does less yearly foot traffic than even Shirakawa's Wonderland of Rocks. Being here in Chaco Canyon completely redefined how I see the entire history of the American Southwest and the role of Americans in it, and yet this place is barely a footnote in any of the guidebooks I've ever seen about the region. Is it because being here is so dissonant with the simpler conceptions of the country that I had grown up with? This was not any kind of untouched Edenic wilderness, uncivilized. It had been civilized before, and then that civilization relaxed its grip and let progress slip away. There is a forgotten city in a sacred canyon 150 miles from Albuquerque that no one really talks about. Its walls are a thousand years old in a nation whose memory tends to struggle with the last month and last year. The more I see of the past, the less I see of the simple rags-to-riches story of America that I was taught. The more the future unfolds, the less sense I can make of what we're supposed to be as a country now. I want to believe in America. Its dreams and promises are aspirational in ways that speak to me on a deep and fundamental level. I want our civilization to live up to its better natures and endure. But we wouldn't be the first great people the desert swallowed, nor are we likely to be the last out on the long, winding roads of history yet to come. To ignore Chaco Canyon in our national self-understanding is to ignore its historical lesson. That a city is a fragile thing, more fragile than we can easily perceive in a world of freeways and concrete. Progress does not always follow so linear a path as we're inclined to draw for it if the Earth refuses to cooperate. I was pretty surprised to discover that, driving out of the park northward, the desert was eager to illustrate my anxieties for me. As we're going down the road, Nate and I notice a little house, blown in and partially ruined, but its paint was so cheerful against the blue of the sky that we really wanted to check it out anyway. When we got up to the house, we found it filled with stuff. Almost every ruin I've seen here in the southwest is empty. This one looked like everyone had simply left and never returned. Books on the shelves, furniture decayed where it stood, clothes still clinging to their plastic hangers, a television overturned. Why would anyone simply leave their home and never return? What tragedy or disaster would drive them away? How does this isolated wilderness simply abide the abandonment year after year, leaving things where they sit? I still don't much know, but I guess it must happen all the time. Although the current government's official position these days seems to be climate change denialism, the weather does get inarguably stranger every year now, no matter what side of reality you choose to sit on. This year, it's the bomb cyclones making headlines. Already a rare weather occurrence when the first one struck in March, a second, even more severe one would land right in the middle of Nate and I's path as we moved from New Mexico towards Utah. We had only two days before colossal snows would render huge parts of the state impassable in the middle of April. So we decided to cut south across the extreme lower part of Utah and the extreme upper part of Arizona, skipping huge portions of the planned trip through the uranium mining country north of Lake Powell. We had a single day of southeastern Utah before making the long detour, so it was imperative that we make the most of it. So we went to the most scenic, culturally contentious place within range the Valley of the Gods. I spoke of it briefly in the companion video, but I underplayed the full extent of how incredible this place is. Only 30 miles north of Monument Valley, it features the exact same landscape, but with a tiny fraction of the traffic due to its greater obscurity. Where Monument Valley is featured in dozens, if not hundreds of westerns, Valley of the Gods' most prominent film credit is being the backdrop of two popular Matt Smith Doctor Who episodes. A 17-mile dirt road winds through it, with the deepest and strangest part of the valley unfolding towards the northern part of the road, farthest from the town of Mexican Hat. Coming on the eve of the bomb cyclone was producing some remarkable weather effects. On the drive across the state, the red Utah soil was stirred up by the high winds into big dust clouds that colored the sky's rust. The winds continued as we wound along the valley floor, kicking up little whirlwinds and swirls of dust as the wind careened between buttes and monoliths. We got there close to sunset, and the light was as radiant as I'd ever seen it. Sometimes in the desert the sun is sharp and cruel, but times like this it feels as big and friendly as something out of a child's finger painting. Valley of the Gods is managed by the BLM, so camping there is free. Valley of the Gods is just the southernmost tip of a massive region of ancestral Puebloan lands and gravity-defying stone towers. 
In 2016, then-President Obama declared this part of the state to be Bears Ears National Monument. It was the end result of decades of lobbying on behalf of the regional tribes, five of whom entered into a historical coalition to make their voice heard and make the monument happen. The protections would preserve and protect the ancestral sites and the rugged scenery of the region from the uranium mining industry. Just 11 months after Bears Ears was formed, now President Trump declared his intention to eliminate Bears Ears, and when he found that he had no authority to do so, he simply removed 1.3 million acres, or 85% of the protected area of the park, from the monument's boundaries. The Tribal Coalition is suing in the ongoing case Hopi Tribe vs. Trump on the basis that this historically unprecedented gutting of a national monument is something only Congress has the power to exercise. Back in Chaco Canyon, the Trump administration was beginning to lease oil and gas rights within the ancient city's limits, with the pinky promise that those companies build their seesawing oil pumps around the thousand-year foundations and not on top of them. Like many aspects of American civic life, environmental conservation policy and practice is being systematically dismantled and eroded. It seems like a small thing compared to the more pressing and glaring injustices like the human rights abuses at the border, but it may be some of the longest lasting damage of this era. When even the youngest of the Trump lifetime court appointments curls up in a corner and expires of old age or terminal flatulence or however they decide to go, whatever lands are looted and vandalized will stay that way for hundreds of years. In the deep desert, things can take thousands of years to change an inch. The fight over Bears Ears National Monument is a fight over vision as much as it is over land use. It's my feeling, and many others, that the American character, what makes us who we are culturally and temperamentally, is fundamentally tied to landscape. The deep deserts of Utah are a one-of-a-kind treasure, something that makes this place unique globally. By protecting these places and the heritage of the people who settled this land first, we hang on to something timelessly American in a world of increasing standardization of art and architecture. The counter-argument says that America is, first and foremost, an economic machine. If there's money to be made, it should be made. History and future be damned if it increases profits in the present. Private industry or public lands. Profit for the few or preservation for the many. A comment I get on nearly every video I make is an appeal to stop being so political as if there's any holding yourself above these things. There is no corner of the country, no matter how remote, that is untouched or unaffected by the crisis of policy and morality that's taken hold of American civic life. The valley and the hills above it took 25 million years to form into the skyscrapers of rock you see today. You might think a national monument designation is frivolous, bureaucratic. It isn't. It's the difference between an open road and a chain-link fence, between sacred ruins and belching smokestacks. It is so easy to call a landscape like this otherworldly, and often I'm very inclined to, but this is Earth, our only planet, our home. This strange and singular beauty is worth protecting, for its own sake, for my own right to be out here in it. Believing in the value of those things is an inherently political stance. A good museum and a lonely dirt road wandering through the pillars of ancient sandstone can be radicalizing forces in a world that is increasingly hostile to knowledge, history, and nature itself. Nate and I camped in the valley and watched Patrick Swayze's Roadhouse off of a little external hard drive that Nate had brought. A few thousand miles back, I might have found the idea of a legendary bar bouncer a little much, but this deep into the trip, it seemed like a reasonable enough honorific to give somebody. By the time we woke up in the morning, the sky was an ominous gray and little raindrops were beginning to fall. As we moved south into Monument Valley, the storm clouds obscured the horizon and shrouded it in an uncharacteristically dreary mystery. The Navajo run the whole park area that Monument Valley sits in, and the Navajo Territory in northern Arizona represents one of the largest reservations in the west by land area. There is no hard border, travel is just as free as anywhere else in the, in the country, but this is one of the most iconic landscapes of the entire Southwest, and one of the only truly famous places of the Southwest to still be in the hands of its original owners. As we moved through, the temperature continued to drop and snow began to fall as hard winds pushed the bush back and forth on the road, like ghostly little fingers catching on the roof and pulling it aimlessly. The original route called for a big diagonal across Utah's Capitol Reef Desert, but all those mountain passes would be impassable by now. So we did a big crescent into Arizona instead, and up again on the western side of Utah, frustratingly close to Las Vegas where I had already been, and then up through to Cedar City on our way to Great Basin National Park. 
It was a brutal day of travel, nothing but cold feet, high winds, and angry traffic streaming past the old slow bus. After spending the night in Cedar City, though, things immediately began to improve as soon as we left the inhabited freeway corridor and went into the sparse, dry mountains that undulate along the border between Utah and Nevada. Small mountains and long valleys so dominate this part of the country that the whole multi-state region is called the Basin and Range Province. One of these ancient mountains was bisected by a stream whose slow trickling wore down a gap in the range. The water-carved rocks formed notches that happened to frame the sun of the winter solstice perfectly. Ten thousand years ago, the people of the region erected two cairns to show travelers and pilgrims exactly where to view that solstice from. Calendars were a hard thing to come by in early civilizations, so people would travel from far away to see them, to Parwan Gap. As a result, ten thousand years' worth of petroglyphs, many from distinct and separate tribes, began to line the rock walls further down the gap. Some were diagrams, some told stories, some gave advice, and the specific meanings of a lot of them are mostly lost to time. Parwan Gap is in the middle of nowhere as we'd conceive it as modern urban Americans. Cedar City, 27 miles away, is by far the largest town in the area at a population of 31,000, but everything west of that is wilderness, all the way across Nevada until you get to Reno, either along the equally deserted US-6 or US-50, the latter of which has made a name for itself as the loneliest road in America. In the long centuries before the American landscape had ever been touched by roads or even by native cities, Parowan Gap was a place of great importance and fame. It seems so small, just an eighth of a mile to walk across, if that. The petroglyphs make up for that smallness of area, though, in depth of impact. The art, informational art in some cases, depicting lunar travel and calendar function, is unlike anything else I'd seen on the road, including the art at places like Chaco Canyon. The drive towards creativity is a human constant, but the limitless differences in how that creativity can be expressed is just mind-boggling. These petroglyphs are, in some cases, as ancient as the pyramids of Egypt. Orienting this trip around Cold War history and video game topography the way I have, it is not too hard to imagine the worlds of the things I'm seeing, to picture ruins in their heyday, to imagine engineers assembling the rusting hulks of industrial rot. Even the Chacoan great houses had walls and foundations that you could extend imaginatively upwards and cover with floors and doors in your mind's eye. I am completely stumped by the Parawan petroglyphs. These were made by a people I can't even begin to picture, living lives that I struggle to imagine at all. They are mysterious to a degree that is almost uncomfortable in person. Vanished peoples and vanished worlds, with only the rocks lining the old dry stream bed, able to give evidence of their passing. The rocks of the gap are old enough to have, elsewhere but nearby, a preserved dinosaur footprint. It's the same earth, I guess, but the passage of time is frightening and its power to erase when you follow the brown and white forest service signs out to a place like Parowan Gap. It's enough to make a person want to really appreciate the small sliver of the present that we have access to. To celebrate by obliterating your appreciation for the past and future with a night of drinking and gambling, all you gotta do is head north from Parowan Gap to the extremely peculiar border town of Wendover, Utah and West Wendover, Nevada. The Utah side is small and functional, gas stations, houses, a small restaurant or two, and a crumbling airbase that once trained the pilots who destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. On the main road through town, the state boundary is marked on the asphalt. On one side, a gigantic casino, the Montego Bay Resort, looking extremely 80s in its white plastic dystopian style. On the other side, a run-down shell gas station. If you turn south at that gas station and wind through the crumbling, deserted parts of the Utah town, you eventually reach the airbase. Some parts are still in use as a public airport, but only one of the historic hangars is fully restored, the one that housed the Enola Gay as its crew was training together in January of 1945, while the Manhattan Project came together and plans were made to drop the bomb on Japan. The 509th Composite Air Group was formed in the summer of 1943 for the sole purpose of dropping the then-completely theoretical atomic bomb. That training is one of the things that made deployment of the bomb so fast once the Trinity test was complete and the weapon proven. The rest of the airfield is in a state of quiet decay. There's obviously some effort toward preservation, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of budget to do much more than let the ruins of the airbase continue to exist in peace. The Wendover Air Base was one of the Manhattan Project sites that really surprised me. 
I wanted to come to Wendover with the express purpose of taking a break from the desert and getting drunk. There's a KOA corporate campground that's literally behind the casino row. It would be the closest to a town that I had ever been able to camp in in the bus. It was only in looking into the history of the town once I had decided to go there already that I realized I was crossing paths with the bomb again, far to the northwest from Trinity, along the Great Salt Flats of Utah. Before World War II, Wendover was barely there. The airbase breathed life into the town. But when the airbase closed, the town found itself in a geographically unique position. It was, as the crow flies, the closest spot on the Nevada border to Salt Lake City. Utah is, if you didn't know, intensely Mormon and hasn't got the kind of free drinking, slot machines in the gas stations kind of approach to vice that Nevada has. So if you're in disagreement with a religious temperance or are a Mormon who's just in a misbehaving sort of mood, West Wendover is the most convenient destination to scratch that itch. There's a free shuttle called the Fun Bus that goes direct across the salt desert between this unlikely gambling oasis and the Utah State Capitol. When Nate and I were out in the casinos, they were all completely packed, no matter how cheap or how old. The atmosphere was chatty, much chattier than other gambling towns I'd been to, with people constantly recognizing each other and calling out. Nate and I heard at least three times someone yell out, Dude, how'd you get here? And invariably the answer would come back, Oh man, I took the fucking fun bus, dude. Nate isn't much of a gambler because he has good common sense, so after he patiently indulged me and downed a few free drinks at the tables with me, we went out exploring. West Wendover is a strip of neon glitter maybe a mile and a half long, terminating at a gigantic neon cowboy named Wendover Will. The casinos are bright and eye-catching against the desert, but they don't much rate against the casinos of Reno or Fremont, let alone the Vegas Strip, in terms of tasteless majesty. But Wendover is impossibly cheap and very pedestrian-friendly. You can walk all the way up to Wendover Will and have a beer with the old cowboy if you like, which I liked quite a bit myself. Designed for the State Line Casino in 1952 by the same guy who did Fremont's Vegas Vic, Wendover Will was restored and moved to its present location in 2005 as a matter of civic pride. Will represents the town's ambitions and character better than anything else I could possibly come up with. Delightful from far away, a little confusing up close, and most of all charming in a dusty, preposterous manner as he winks at you and invites you to rest your weary bones with some cards and a cold beverage. I've seen a lot of neon cheese this trip, but Wendover Will is king in my book. Besides simply being a 63-foot-tall neon cowboy, Will's geographic isolation and position of local honor makes him something very special for this part of the country. Utah is naturally beautiful, but socially quite conservative. From across the invisible boundary of the state line, Wendover Will winks and beckons. In this vacuum of desert, Americans have littered the Sandy Valley with symbols of their dreams and desires and national choices. A giant neon cowboy who tempts the poor Mormons to sin. An airfield that once housed the machine used to deliver the deaths of tens of thousands of Japanese civilians during the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Collapsed barracks, run-down gas stations, bright lights, empty pockets. The contrasts of our messy personal lives and our equally messy civic lives, sun-bleached, naked, on an ancient lake bed of salt. The next day on the road was marked by disappointment, misadventure, and by the very end of it, Total batshit madness. Nate had been traveling with me for more than a week, him in the bus and me sleeping in a tent that Nate had provided. The next leg of the trip was supposed to have us going up to the Idaho National Laboratory lands and all the atomic miscellany that they held. The bomb cyclone, though, would really come back to bite us in the ass here. We drove all day headed toward one of my favorite places, Craters of the Moon National Monument on the way to Arco, Idaho. When we got there, the entire monument was shut down with five feet of snow on the roads, lightly packed snow that swallows your entire leg every few steps if you try to hike on it. It was a bust. So we went to Arco, the first town ever powered by atomic energy, bound for the first ever electricity producing atomic power plant, the EBR-1. The EBR-1 was, of course, closed for the season. Busted again. Bus travel is fun and exciting, but it's not easy all the time. We came hundreds of miles specifically to see these things, fighting wind and cold and traffic, so arriving at locked gates and shuttered windows is a meaningfully deep frustration. Bus travel is a risk. You're risking mechanical failure and other road emergencies, you're paying money for gas and sometimes for food, with not a 100% expectation that it's going to pan out. 
There was, at least, an especially fascinating consolation prize in the EBR-1's parking lot. The prototypes for a one-of-a-kind, never-completed atomic nu jet aircraft. The plaques at the site call it, quote, an idea obsolete almost the moment it was conceived. The WS-125 project attempted to use two small nuclear reactors, which are what you actually see here, long ago stripped of radioactive material, to power General Electric turbofan engines. The tests were successful, powering the jet engines nearly to full thrust with nuclear power. But the expense far outweighed the advantages. The decades-running B-52 program was considerably more cost-effective on top of being safer and more stable. The WS-125 program was considered kind of a dead end by the Air Force by 1956, yet it wasn't until a billion, billion with a B dollars had been spent on the effort in 1961 that President Kennedy defunded it. In 1956, this was some of the most sophisticated military equipment in the entire world. Now, it rusts in this parking lot. They are incredible, intricate objects, made much stranger by the casual circumstances in which they've been discarded. As if they were sculptures and not machines meant to, power, meant to use the power of the atom to fly through the air. Sculptures is all they are now, though, it's true. They'll never serve their economically impractical purpose again. They exist like a sawn-off branch of the historical tree, a future imagined that never came together. Pop culture in the 1950s dreamt of an atomic-powered golden age with planes exactly like they were trying to make here. It never arrived. It was cheaper to move in a different direction instead. The snows had closed almost every campground and dirt road near us, and neither Nate or I had very much money left, so we called up the bartender in Atomic City, Idaho. The bar there is just about the only business left, but it's been open for decades thanks to a summertime boom of people coming out to do stock car racing at the Atomic City Motor Track. The bartender told me that it is free to camp in the little park right across from the bar, so that's where we went. We had been driving since 9 in the morning, crossing huge distances to arrive at small disappointments. The parking lot of the EBR-1 was certainly more interesting than I expected, but I had also expected to see inside of a nuclear power plant, so there's that. Nate, too. So we drove down eight miles of gravel road to what has to be one of the most remote, bizarre watering holes in America. We were ready to blow off some serious steam when we got there. Things were great starting off, too. Incredible fun. The bartender was a bearded old joker type who spoke in a kind of lingering, jovial rasp. Everyone in the bar was curious how we had even found the place and were eager to share their own stories, mostly hunters from the mountains or engineers from the laboratories. The bar is small, but the conversation is constant, and the mood of the place is friendlier than just about anywhere else I'd been on the entire trip. Thing is, there's three phases to a drinking evening that goes off the rails. The first is the build-up phase. Things necessarily have to begin well, or you'd never have been comfortable enough to drink so heavily as to make it to phase two. This is the danger phase. Something happens that turns the evening sideways. It happens slightly enough that you don't dip out when it does happen. This leads to the third phase, the confusion phase, where you're much too drunk to manage what's going on, but you're going to have to muddle through it anyway. We asked the bartender when he closed the place, and he said, whenever I feel like it, so we stayed until a little after 10 when the place cleared out. Nate and I were about to go set up our tent when danger phase wandered in from the night, a couple in their late 30s in a big old 90s jeep. They came in, we got to talking, we got to buying each other shots, buying the bartender shots, and about 45 minutes time, a whole new bottle of whiskey was gone when we had been pissed drunk when the cork first came off. Things are still going great. The bartender takes us all out to see one of the racing cars he's got. It's a primer gray 1960s Impala with a Mad Max looking supercharger. He revs it up and it sounds like an absolute beast. After that, we put on the radio. That's the moment it turned. This guy's wife, or whatever she was, starts dancing, then grinding on her feller a bit, then dancing on the bar, and I'd like to be polite about her ambitions for after that, but whatever she was aiming for was spectacularly disrailed when her dude and the bartender got into some sort of argument about something the bartender said about her when she was dancing, which Nate and I didn't overhear. I'm 30 myself, I've been going to bars a while, but this was the first time I ever did see a man fistfight the bartender. 
The bartender then brought a pal over from next door who kicked the couple out of town, screaming at them as they flee into the night in their jeep, who are weaving on the gravel and screaming back. Which seemed like a pretty good time to call it a night for Nate and I, so I try and fail in the drunken darkness to get my tent set up, and then I collapse into a twisted pile of tent poles and sleeping bag on the ground. This is where phase three of the evening begins. Some amount of time later, Nate is yelling at me. He says, get up, get the fuck up, get your fucking dog. I slur something like, why are you so mad? And Nate yells, look at my fucking face. And sure enough, the man is just covered in blood. Maybe the dingo, apparently, had attacked him when he tried to go into the bus and then run off into the night. She was circling us out there and barking her head off. So I'm trying with difficulty to stand up and Nate's mad and I'm getting mad and the dog is making a tremendous racket. I feel bad because Nate is bleeding a lot, but I'm also just about blackout drunk, so fuck this guy, right? Finally, I just yell at him to go back to the bus and take care of himself, and I'll find the dog. Maybe is super freaked out, so whenever I approach, she backs away. She stays about a foot away from me, moving backwards for maybe an hour or so. I can barely see the lights of the town anymore. I see her face in the moonlight, but not the road. The floor of the world is just undifferentiated, inky blackness. This is when I fall into a three-foot ditch, roll to the bottom, and immediately vomit. I'm down there, in the ditch, vomiting, sobbing, calling for my dog, so she finally comes up and licks my face as if to say, you don't seem okay there, do ya, friend? This trip has taken me to some unexpected places, but to have an evening as bizarro world fucked up as this one, in a town with less than 30 people total living in it, was a surprise. In every way. The dog and I make it back to the bus, and I fall asleep sitting upright in the front section of the bus because the wind has blown my tent away, and I am not interested in finding it. In the morning, the first thing Nate and I do is apologize to each other, and then the second thing we do is drive directly to Salt Lake City. We were headed there to catch his flight back to LA anyway, but we had both been sad the trip was coming to an end, both reluctant to let go of the road rhythms we had found. Waking up excruciatingly hungover, covered in blood, covered in vomit, with portions of our cash and gear and dignity gone forever, made both of us feel like, you know, maybe there are worse things than going home. There's a lot of perils out on the road, but it's not the snow or the wind or the radiation that I found most dangerous. The most dangerous thing out here was the appetite for adventure that I had brought along with me in the first place. That night before his flight home in Salt Lake City, Nate got us a motel room and a pizza so that we didn't have to miss the premiere of the final season of Game of Thrones. We drove for seven hours, slept for four, and then fell in line with millions on millions of other people, with their eyes glued to Premium Cable's latest and greatest. It was nice to feel part of something current after having been nosed down in history and dirt for weeks after weeks and miles after miles. Atomic City had been exhausting, and we were damn near broke. When I was in Arco, I realized that the bomb cyclone had dropped too much snow on, Mon on Montana to make it to any of the places I wanted to go there, even if I had gas money to get there. No, there were only two truly important things left to do. The first was to see the Hanford B reactor back home in Washington, where the nuclear material that was detonated at the Trinity site was first processed. But before I could even get there, I needed to get back to Bend, Oregon to pick up Simon the dog and take him home. Kendra, my wife, had taken a trip of her own and left him down there at middays for me to scoop up on my way back. I drove for two days from Salt Lake City to get there, functional freeway days of tedious miles and podcast binges, but I arrived in time for a very important date. Our mutual healer birthdays. Maybe's littermate, Quest, got picked up by Mitty and Rachel when the four of us were living together in Gunnison, Colorado a couple summers back during the first big bus trip that Kendra and I went on. Now, these dogs are two years old. When we got them, maybe fit in the palm of my hand. In fact, that's why I wanted to choose her. The others just ran around, but she came up to me, said hello with her tiny paws, and then curled up in my hands and went to sleep. As much as I could be chosen by the dog, I was. Quest is a fine boy himself, a little larger and bulkier than maybe, with an overall sweeter temperament. Maybe is strange. She gets strong notions, and she's got real antisocial tendencies for a dog. To her chosen people, she is incredibly sweet, but she has got a feral streak, a look in her eye of faraway madness that Quest just doesn't much get. He's a good boy. 
Maybe is optimistically chaotic neutral no matter how much affection I have for her personally. Nate forgave Maybe for scratching him up, and said it was something of his fault too because he was drunkenly, drunkenly messing with her, but still, that's some bad dog shit right there. She is a goddamn weird animal. I think her strangeness is something that I like about her especially, though. I never know all the way what Maybe is thinking, or how much she knows, how many words she understands. It often feels like she's hiding some fierce intelligence, that she speaks English fluently, but then she does something truly goofy which diminishes my suspicions that she's plotting something nefarious with pulleys and wires somewhere. Personally, I was just really grateful to have had her company on this trip. To be fully alone on my pilgrimage would have been fine, I would have found meaning in it, but Every single morning I would wake up and this little hound would be so happy to be alive and so excited for what the day would bring that I couldn't possibly be anywhere but on her level about it. One of my favorite days of the trip was weeks back. I was at the Lunar Crater in central Nevada reading a book before sunset. I had hiked the rim and made myself food already. I was parked right on the precipice of the old caldera. Through every window of the bus was a beautiful slice of the weary and vast desert, with the thick late afternoon light warming my skin and my blankets where it passed through the old glass. I was absolutely, completely at peace with myself, with the world. I was a cozy animal in a secret place, and so was this little dog. We fell asleep there together with the windows open, and when morning came, the dog and I stretched together in the fresh sunshine, ate together, opened the bus door to find a place to piss together, and then rolled down the byway together, each of us with eyes glued into the horizon in anticipation of what would come next. After the hike out to Jawbone Flats for Maybe and Quest's birthdays, the road trip was pretty well over. I wasn't ready to stop, I had so much more I wanted to see, but the end was as clear as the $67 I had left in my wallet. Going to the Hanford site was the last thing that I could feasibly do. Luckily, that was one of the most impressive, mind-blowing, and historically significant things of the whole trip. I was on my way to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation along the Columbia River in south-central Washington to see the B reactor where the plutonium that was detonated at the Trinity site came from in the first place. I didn't understand what the Hanford reactor represented until I was there. In many ways, it was the greatest scientific and engineering feat of the entire Manhattan Project. Without it, the Trinity test would have been delayed for years. The world would be much different. Thing is, to understand the significance of the B-reactor, you have to understand plutonium a bit, which I didn't, even through much of the bulk of my trip. It wasn't until the retired nuclear physicists who give the B-reactor tours took the time to explain it to me personally in detail and answer my questions that it all kind of clicked for me. The biggest question I had is, why use plutonium at all? Uranium comes from the ground. It's a naturally fissionable element. So why go through all the trouble to make plutonium, which doesn't exist in nature? The Earth had never borne witness to plutonium pretty much at all until the mid-1940s, and then right here in Washington State. How could this possibly be preferable or simpler than just mining bomb material? The problem is that 93% of uranium is worthless for atomic power. In an average sample of uranium ore, 93% is U-238, a version of uranium that's actually mostly inert and non-reactive. It's uranium-235 that's the crazy one, the one you can crack open for its sweet, sweet atomic power. At the Oak Ridge site in Tennessee, uranium enrichment was such a slow process that after two years of production, the U.S. government had only produced one single bomb's worth of material. If we had to rely on U-235 alone, there would be fewer bombs in the entire world by a pretty large margin. But in the atomic fires of a reactor core, U-235 can actually transmute its sibling element U-238 into a completely different, heavier element. In the extreme heat of the neutron flux, uranium-238 can take on greater atomic mass and become neutronium. More heat and more nuclear trauma can bulk up the nucleus even further, making it plutonium. Other extremely radioactive elements like cesium develop from the plutonium if you leave it in the, re in the reactor long enough. It's this conversion process, which is basically actual honest-to-god alchemy, that allows you to turn 93% of unusable bullshit uranium into something that can function just as well as the 7% of U-235 that you'll get in nature. The B reactor produces no electricity. It never did. The only singular purpose of the facility and its five-story tall reactor core is to act as a kiln for plutonium. You see here on the face of the core, 2,004 tubes. Each tube holds 18 rods of uranium, about the size of your forearm. 
Using graphite to slow and moderate the speed of neutrons so that a nuclear reaction can occur and be maintained, the frenetic, chaotic U-235 would excite and radicalize the U-238 U within the fuel rod. After a few days in the nuclear kiln, it's pushed out the other side of the core into a pool of water to cool off and cook off its radioactivity so it's able to be handled and processed. The Hanford Reservation is one of the most toxic places in the entire world, not because of what happened inside the core, but because of these cooling pools, mostly. They would fill with a sludge that won't stop being poisonous to life for another 23,000 years. But, on the other hand, you got what you paid for. Plutonium. Unstable and unlikely plutonium to be used for peace or war, depending on global mood. The thing to keep in mind about the Hanford site is that before the facility was built, none of this had ever been practically tested. It was all completely theoretical. Construction began in 1943 by the DuPont Company, and it was completed in just 11 months. The core, this massive, frightening, transfixing object, was unlike anything that had ever been built in human history. Nuclear power wasn't even the goal. The bomb was. This facility, the most advanced facility in the history of our entire species when it was completed, was a gamble that the material that it produced would fission. The enriched uranium that the Oak Ridge facility in Tennessee produced was used in the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, but the Trinity test, the diagnostic for the whole political and scientific future of the human race, necessarily had to use plutonium. If they tested the uranium, it would be years before another bomb could be constructed. It worked. It all worked. Every last part of it. I thought that the Trinity site was pretty much where the atomic age began. That's wrong. It was this place, this building, this core, where the future was literally made, one atom at a time, in the great uranium kiln of southern Washington. What was it, though, that we had wrought? Although the greatest attention is usually paid to Hiroshima, the first city sacrificed to the beast we'd born into the world, it was the detonation at Nagasaki where the exact same sort of device we had detonated at Trinity was first used in war. Unlike Hiroshima, they sent a writer along with that bomb, a war correspondent named William Lawrence. He recorded the moment like this, quote, Observers in the tail of our plane saw a giant ball of fire rise as though from the bowels of the earth, belching forth enormous white smoke rings. Next, they saw a giant column of purple fire, 10,000 feet high, shooting skyward with enormous speed. By the time our ship had made another turn in the direction of the atomic explosion, the pillar of purple fire had reached our altitude. Only about 45 seconds had passed. Awestruck, we watched it shoot like a meteor from the earth instead of from outer space, becoming ever more alive as it climbed skyward through the white clouds. It was no longer smoke or dust, or even a cloud of fire. It was a living thing, a new species of being, born right before our incredulous eyes." End quote. From the air, a thing of terrifying beauty. From the ground, a thing of depthless evil. The ground underneath where the uranium bomb at Hiroshima was detonated reached 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. A survivor, 15-year-old Machiko Yamaoka, described the day, quote, There was no sound. I felt something strong. It was incredibly intense. I felt colors. It wasn't heat. You can't call it yellow. And it wasn't blue." End quote. Yamaoka was buried in the rubble, and when she was dug out, she found most of her family dead, and then later described that scene to a historian who took down her account. From the historian, Nearby were people trying to push intestines back into their bodies. Headless bodies, legless bodies, seared and swollen faces. She encountered a friend and called out. The friend at first did not respond, and then called out, Miss Yamaoka, you look like a monster. Only then did Machiko know how badly she had been burned. End quote. By the Eisenhower era, we had naturally moved on to Atoms for Peace, a hope that America could use the incredible power it had harnessed for progress instead of destruction. Some of that future has come true. Most of it hasn't. While atomic energy still powers some of the world, all of the world is threatened by the weapons that still sit in their holes and in the bellies of jets, waiting for word to come down that the end of all things is upon us. Recently, the Trump administration has asked the Defense Department to look into small-scale nuclear weapons, smaller-yield atomic bombs that could, theoretically, be used as a more conventional weapon and not trigger the mutually assured destruction that's prevented their use so far in the post-World War II era. All the experts say that such a thing is impossible. To use one is to invite the use of them all, an atomic Schlieffen plan that will kill the world in the time it takes to watch an episode of The Bachelor. Yet the fantasy persists of limitless power, limitless aggression, without pushback. The generations who grew up with the bomb 
are afraid of it. They know from back when they were children ducking and covering under their school desks that atomic war means indiscriminate genocide. For myself and my generation, we have no such memories. I think the first I ever heard of the bomb was when I talked my dad into taking me to see Bruce Willis in Armageddon, where there is much drama surrounding whether they'll nuke that asteroid or not. It was just another sci-fi motif, just another fantastical story of human triumph and human folly. As I cross that sad line into my 30s, I am properly frightened. Atomic energy could bring about a new era of human progress. It still has that unlocked potential yet to explore. There are designs for spaceship engines that could, theoretically, run for thousands of years off the heat from decaying elements beyond plutonium. Yet, it seems more likely to me that we'll never get there. It seems like, instead of learning from the past, we have rejected it entirely as having no bearing on our present. There is only the great American id, childish, greedy, and the further we get from a public consensus on the danger of these weapons, the closer we get to an atomic temper tantrum that could put an end not only to our people, our culture, our future, but the future of everyone else that we share the planet with as well. Like they said in war games, when it comes to a global thermonuclear conflict, the only winning move is not to play. Yet we do. We play it every day. Like a toddler with a hand grenade, we poke, we prod, we pull, and we play. In making this trip, I have seen more of my country than I ever realized existed at all. More beauty, more strangeness, more meaning, a lot more history. We live in a difficult, confusing time, yet in delving deep into the physical space of America, into its hidden and forgotten places and its peculiar histories, there is comfort. There has never been a time that wasn't confusing and difficult. Those confusions compound over time into something like the sandstone that lines the canyon walls of the places I'd been. There is beauty in the chaos and the confusion. There's hope. In my efforts to make an atomic pilgrim of myself, I discovered that I was not alone in what I was trying to do. Sure, the roads are mostly empty out here, and the history is mostly forgotten, but the feeling I had in my gut, that there are things not known and not understood, and if I could simply stumble across those things out here, I'd be a better person for it, is a shockingly common sentiment. It seems to me that the greatest struggle for modern Americans isn't survival or success, it's the struggle for coherency, to understand where we were and where we are now. I'll freely admit that I haven't always had a good picture of either. The road taught me a little different. The road taught me quite a bit. It showed me an America mo both monstrous and magnificent. Where we go from here as a country, I have no idea. We have the capacity within us for transcendent progress, to move from a world of horses to splitting the atom in a single lifetime. We can also lean towards suicidal idiocy. I want to say cooler heads will prevail. I want to say this in an era where America threatens the rest of the world with war over Twitter. I don't know how the future will turn out at all anymore. I've lost faith in my ability to even guess. I do know we'll never fit the eulogy for our civilization into 240 fucking characters. Those are the stakes of the game that we've played and the world that we've made, ever since that blinding pre-morning flash of light on July 16th, 1945. Thanks for watching.